In this video, we're going to finish the topic of diaphragm design. In a previous video, we looked at loading in the y direction. Today, we'll look at loading in the x direction. This is going to be a little bit more difficult because there's eccentricity in the x direction, whereas in the y direction, the center of rigidity and the center of mass were aligned with each other. In the x direction, the center of rigidity and the center of mass are not aligned with each other. To remind ourselves, collectors are elements that are in line with the lateral force resisting systems, and we see them here along lines one and two. Cords are elements that resist bending, intention, and compression forces at the edges of the diaphragms. I've shown cords here and here. The lateral force resisting elements also need to be able to resist those same tension compression forces. Let's get started with loading in the x direction. First, a disclaimer. There's a few complications in this example that I wish weren't here, but given that we chose a sample scenario, we need to finish the problem through to its logical conclusion. I'll try to present those topics as simply as possible so that they don't distract us, but at the same time I will mention them so that they don't just get completely swept under the rug. This is the diagram for the diaphragm, collectors, cords, and the loading in the x direction. The procedure will start exactly the same as loading in the y direction, and that is finding the magnitude of the distributed loads proportional to mass. So for the three different regions, there's a large 20 by 75 region and two smaller 10 by 30 regions. Those are the cantilevered regions between lines two and three. I've indicated their area and sum the total area. The load is equal to the mass of each section divided by the total area here. We have various widths for each of the sections. The larger section is 20 feet, the smaller section is 10 feet, and so we can then calculate the distributed load as the load divided by the width. Those are the values on the diagram that we just calculated. Next, we need to find the forces in the lateral force resisting elements. This will be a little bit different than in the y direction. Because of the eccentricity, torsion will come into play. In the y direction, it was sufficient to simply say that the forces were proportional to rigidity. Here we have to do a full analysis with torsion. So we repeat the same kind of calculation that we did before. We only include the inherent eccentricity. The accidental eccentricity is taken to zero because we don't consider accidental eccentricity in diaphragm design. We can calculate the moment, and if you have any questions about this, please review the previous video where we discussed this. For the walls in the x direction, there's a translational component. For all the walls, there's a torsional component. Summing up the translational and the torsional components give us the net force in the wall, which we can then indicate in the diagram. There's one more step before we can start making cuts in this diaphragm and calculating internal forces, such as moment and shear. I'll repeat over here on the right-hand side the same diaphragm with the same forces that we just calculated. But for now, I've omitted the horizontal forces. I'll introduce one change. Talking, for instance, about the force on line A, 9.22 kips, I'll consider it being distributed over the length that it can be distributed. Similarly, the 0.56 kips along grid line B, I'll also consider that being distributed along the whole length that it can be distributed. The 9.22 kips was distributed over this length of 20 feet the 0.56 kips was distributed over this length of 30 feet. This is one of those complications that I wish weren't in this problem. You won't have to make this decision in any of the problems that we do in the class, so please feel free to take this simply as a given quantity. I will tell you that if I were to have distributed this 9.22 kips over 30 feet, that would have resulted in a situation that couldn't equilibrate. Now the reason for this is tied to the fact that this is a free edge and so those 9.22 kips can't go all the way out to grid line 3 because they have nothing to react to. Next, we'll start making cuts and we'll see how we calculate internal forces such as moment and shear. We'll start by making a cut through the long section of the diaphragm. That is a section between grid lines 1 and 2. So I've included everything to the left of the cut. Of course, since I've made a cut, now I need to replace what used to be there by internal forces. So I'm showing here a shear and a moment. Reminding myself that the coordinate y measures from grid line 1 to the right, I can now write equations for shear and moment as a function of y. Shear has a positive contribution from this 3.93 kips per foot times the width of the section y. That's the first term. The second term is from this force over here 
from the lateral force resisting element, and we see that second term in the equation. The moment equation has more terms. We'll go through them one by one, first keeping in mind that we're summing moments about the cut. 66.43 kips acts over a distance y. The resultant of this distributed load, 3.93 kips per foot times the distance y, is the resultant. The location of the resultant is at y over 2, and that gives me the second term, 3.93y times y over 2, or simply 3.93y squared over 2. Next, I'll look at the horizontal forces. Looking at the couple with the 9.22 kips per 20 feet, the total force is 9.22 over 20 times y. The moment arm for that couple is that 75 feet. And now the other force, this is the distributed load of 0.56 over 30. Multiply that by y to get the force. Multiply that force by the moment arm to get the moment. In the book that we're using, how these transverse forces were resolved was done a little bit differently by considering a distributed moment over the length of the beam. Remember that we're looking at the diaphragm as an equivalent beam. This is the same procedure. It's a little bit different on the surface, and this will give you two different ways to think about it. Choose whichever one works best for you. Now, we need to do another cut. So let's draw our diaphragm with all the forces, and we'll take a cut through the cantilever section. We'll isolate everything now to the right of the cut, including the piece of diaphragm, including the forces that are there. And we'll use a coordinate y2, measuring from the right, where y2 is simply 30 feet minus y. It'll make our math easier. We include the internal forces. One thing to notice here is that because of this distributed force, there's a net horizontal force on this section. So there must be an axial force right here. I've shown this axial force as being at 15 feet. That's actually not totally correct. We don't know where it will be, but this is close enough. But we do recognize that this is an approximate calculation. Having this free body diagram, we can now write equations for shear and moment. Shear acts opposite to what's shown to resist the resultant due to this force of 1.57 times the width of the free body, which is y2. This is the only term in the shear equation. The moment equation is similar to before with fewer terms because there are fewer forces. We'll sum moments about the cut and specifically about the line of action of the axial force. The distributed load of 1.57 is multiplied by y2 to get the resultant. The location of that resultant is at y2 over 2. Combining that gives us this first term, 1.57y2 times y2 over 2, or 1.57y2 squared over 2. The second term comes from that distributed load at the bottom edge of the diaphragm segment. 0.56 over 30 times y2 is the magnitude of the resultant multiplied by 15 feet is the moment arm for that force. This gives us now an expression for moment over the cantilevered segment of the diaphragm. One could do another cut over the other diaphragm segment and show that these two equations are valid for both cantilever segments. So now we have cuts over the relevant segments of the diaphragm. We have the equations. Now let's plot our shear and moment diagrams. There's no reason that these diagrams need to match up. Specifically right here, this looks very strange, but we remember that one of the cuts had to do with the whole 75 foot depth. The other cut had to do with simply the depth between lines A and B. Now we'll use these diagrams to get the design forces for the diaphragms. First, shear. We can identify the maximum value of shear, which is 66.43 kips. Divide that shear by the 75 foot depth, and we get a design shear for the diaphragm of 0.89 kips per feet. We recognize that the answer in the other direction is 1.40 kips per feet, and so the value of 0.89 will not control. This will end up being our controlling value. For these shear values, the diaphragm depth is much smaller, but even if it's much smaller, we still won't get a large enough value in terms of shear per depth using this value here. For a moment, we'll need to look at two different sections. Between grid lines one and two, the long section, the largest value is given right here, 154.33 kip feet 
We'll divide that value by the 75 foot depth to get the chord force. And we have 2.06 kips being the chord force between segments one and two. Next, we'll look at the same point, but on the other side of grid line two on the cantilevered segment. The value of moment here is 81.39, but we divide that by a much smaller depth to get this value of chord force of 2.71 kips. That's the controlling value of chord force, and most likely we would simply use that value over that whole length. We've obtained the design forces for the diaphragm, shear per unit depth and chord forces. We would also need to look at collectors, but as stated previously, collector design was covered in flexible diaphragms. There's nothing different, and so we won't be repeating it here. This finishes the topic of analysis of structures with rigid diaphragms. Woo hoo! Whoop whoop whoop! Whoop whoop whoop!